Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and welcome to Rattlecast number 191. So glad you could join me. Today's guest is Trisha Faye Hefner. She'll be here in about 10 minutes, but before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. Uh, we just do it because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button and share, subscribe, uh, you know, leave some comments on iTunes uh, or on Spotify or... Uh, Whatever else, Amazon. I don't know. Somebody said uh, you can you can find find uh, the podcast just by talking to Alexa and saying like, Alexa, give me the Rattlecast. Well, we'll do that and then give a review, or, and that'll probably be helpful. I don't know. Something will be good. Whatever you can do to help spread poetry on the internet is all we ask because we love poetry, and I know you do. And so spreading it around helps everybody out. And we're going to start, as we always do, with uh, Sunday's Poet. And there's a beautiful little poem um, by Katie Luxem, her second appearance in Rattle, the first in Poets Respond. And here she is, Katie Luxem. Hey, Katie, how are you doing? Hi, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so glad to have you on. Um, it's another, it's very a similar, slightly similar topic to your poem in Rattle number 77. Um, do you want to tell us like how the poem came to be, first of all? Sure. So last week was a super busy week for me, but obviously couldn't help hearing about Ralph Yarl, who was shot in Kansas City, a uh, young boy. And then it seemed like the same day I heard about Kaylin Gillis being shot in upstate New York. And then literally the same day, you know, my daughter, who's in seventh grade, um, started getting we started getting these texts from the school administration that there was potentially a threat of gun violence at school and there was an investigation. They were, were trying to see if it was credible or not. So all day we were kind of getting these text updates and uh, that afternoon I went to pick her up from school and I was just sitting under these beautiful blossoming trees waiting for her and their kids were filtering out and this was just juxtaposed with all this kind of potential horror that seemed to be going on with gun violence the whole day. So um, finally I heard my daughter's side of the story and, and it ended up to be you know mostly rumors she had heard and her friends are texting and talking about it and just basically talking about how scared she was. So later that night I started thinking about how things unfold and this day at my daughter's school wasn't even newsworthy like nothing actually happened but still just the amount of fear and potential danger amid the rumors was really palpable and I'm, I'm sure this goes on far more than we hear and we hear about gun violence a lot so uh, you know our kids are just kind of growing up in this environment as, as, as a, there's a backdrop of it all the time like spring or middle school passing or anything like that so yeah I just uh, wrote down some thoughts that night and came to that poem. Yeah, I definitely you know can relate to that. There, you know, stuff. Our our kids go to a great school, but um, but you know you never know. And and there's certain kids I see, and you can't help but think like, well, you're one to keep an eye on, kid. You know, and um, you just right. never know, which is something that that I never had experience growing up. You know, there were there were fights and bullies and things, but but the idea of of somebody doing that was so foreign. Uh, do you want to go ahead and read the poem, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, sure. All right, rumors. Someone gets mad. A boy brings a gun to school and plans to use it, seventh period. At the end of the day, the bell sounds. My daughter runs to the car like a shot, leaving books and questions in her locker. I hug her under the crooked cherry where blossoms flurry. It's so hard to believe the trees grow this way. Yeah, it's a beautiful little poem. And that last line, it's so hard to believe the trees grow this way. I mean, what a great metaphor that is. Um, how did that come to you? Was it in the process of writing the poem? That's what I was wondering about. Or was it something that you saw the, the tree as a metaphor immediately and said, oh, I need that to be a poem? Yeah, so when I was thinking about it and started writing about it, I wanted the poem to be short, to just be the immediacy and the reactionary nature of both the shooting and then like any event and how quickly things can change. So I wrote out a couple lines about like what actually happened and then moved to the interaction with my daughter. And then I was going through and adjusting it a bit. And I just kept coming back to that image of like, Oh, I'm sitting by the cherry trees and this is kind of, um, you know, juxtaposed to it. And that's when I was like, Oh, you know, I'm going to write the last line about the tree. And so I just played, played around with it for a second and that kind of came out. Yeah. It's such a beautiful, I mean, I mean, you know, so much beauty grows, you know, despite all of this stuff that we have to face as, as parents and kids these days. Yeah. So thanks so much for sharing that Katie. A great yeah. poem. Um, as the other one was too, I encourage everybody to check out your other poem, um, which was uh, Ways to Break My Heart, a very similar topic uh, in, in poem too about, about kids going to school and, and that phase of life. Thanks for sharing it, Katie. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. Take care. And it was Katie Luxon with Sunday's poem, once again, Rumors, um, another poem about an important topic that, that it seems so there, there's no end to poems about that topic. And uh, it's another great one. So thanks for sharing that, Katie. Now we're going to take a quick break and we're going to go to uh, today's main guest, Teresa Faye Hefner. So hang tight and I will be right back in just a moment with uh, more of the show. 
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Like I said, today's guest is Tricia Faye Hefner. Tricia studied poetry outside of academia with poets including Kim Adonizio, Sally Ashton, and Ellen Bass. Her own work has been published in a bunch of journals including Blood Lotus and Cincinnati Review, Hunger Mountain, Poet Lore, Prairie Schooner, and Rattle, of course. Uh, she's the founder of the Poetry Salon, which is a big thing we'll be talking about. Um, and she is the recipient of the 2011 Robert and Adele Schiff Poetry Prize. Hefner is also a three-time Pushcart Prize nominee and author of two chapbooks, The Lone Breakable Night and Take This Longing from Finishing Line Press. She holds a degree in humanistic psychology, which is also something I want to talk about, uh, with a specialization in creative studies from Seabrook University. And her new book, which just came out or is about to come out maybe, is uh, When the Moon Had Antlers, which won the Pangea po- uh, Prize. It is out this spring from Pine Row Press. And here she is, Tricia Faye Hefner. Hey, Tricia, how you doing? Hi, I'm great, Tim. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to make one quick addendum. Uh, uh, Pine Row Press is publishing When the Moon Had Antlers. Um, the whole book did not re- uh, uh, win the Pangea Prize. It was uh, actually a collection of seven poems uh, that won the Pangea Prize. So I just, I don't want to over inflate my <laughs> ego any more than it, it's already been inflated. Well, we know uh, from reading so just, your, uh, your, uh, your textbook on teaching poetry that you want your ego to get out of the way. So it's good not to I have, know, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. um, but definitely, I mean, I think definitely worthy of a prize here. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the actual book, When the Moon Had Antlers. Uh, do you want to start with a poem? Uh, yes, absolutely. Should I start with the one, um, that was published in Rattle, or do you have a preference? Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a good way to start. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and I'm just realizing, of course, that <laughs> that that's the one that I don't have readily available right now. Um, <laughs> if it's okay with you, I'm actually going to start then with um, one of the the opening poems for the book. Sure. Uh, which is territorial boundaries. Um, and not to overinflate my already inflated ego, but uh, but that one was a finalist for the River Heron uh, Poetry Prize. Uh, so I, I guess this is a good poem. Uh, anyways, it's <laughs> Territorial Boundaries. Great. See the way we pocket our sadness, dress in isolation, keep the lights on. We can see what's coming for us. Cars, cable bills, the man who enters without keys. It's a hustle for meaning, odd mating dance of money, whiskeys threatened for $9 a piece. At night, we throw back the sunrise of civilization, smell the first lemony green hops crushed against granite, first grain rolled into bread. It was a mistake, wasn't it? How we separated our families by bricks, our love by wallets, Now the birds sing the same warbles and whistles they've passed down since sunlight started them blazing. But our ears have changed. 
is this why we affix heads of animals on gods, carve wings onto the backs of angels, tattoo ourselves with feathers, to remind us how easy we were as animals, everything built inside our bodies, claws, sinew, a warning signal attuned to someone else's hunger. We wanted nothing but days nursing on rain. Today, deer still circle the forest. They live in an abundance of silence, sleeping on the wet of winter, fur ignited by snow, not even waiting for a thaw. Yeah, great poem. And that was um, Territorial Boundaries, again, from uh, Teresa's new book that's about to come out. Um, Teresa, so so what what drew you to poetry in the first place? In your bio, it mentions um, you know studying poetry outside of academia, not having that usual route, but then you teach so much too. So how did you end up? What yeah. was it that, that made you become a poet? I think, uh, you know, ask me on a different day and you'll get a different answer. Uh, it's been there for a long time. I remember reading The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe and being kind of obsessed with that in eighth grade. And, you know, um, I've always been an emotional person and a performative person and, and kind of my first love, I think, was the theater. And uh, poetry just wound up being, I think, the medium that worked best for me, although I didn't really realize that until the end like the very last uh semester at uc santa cruz um i remember taking a class on uh you know the british canon and i wanted to study more about novels and plays and longer literature i didn't think poetry was really for me i'm like that stuff's short i want a long story um and I was flipping through the British canon. I flipped to the end where we got into the really modern poetry. And I read a poem by Avon Boland called The Lost Land. Mm. And it starts out with a really declarative sentence, a short declarative sentence. I have two daughters. They are all I've ever wanted from the earth. Well, almost all. And then she goes and, and creates this really beautiful, fascinating musical poem about Ireland and absence and it's lovely. And I remember going like, ah, I really should study this, but um, you know, finals are next week and after that I graduate. So I guess, I guess I have to study outside of academia now because I wasn't gonna go back and get uh, a master's degree in poetry. I wasn't gonna go back and get a second degree in poetry. I had a degree, a degree in literature, modern literary studies. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how that happened. And um, after a few years of teaching English, I realized I wanted to do something that I thought was like a little bit more, uh, you know, emotionally helpful, getting to the roots of people. And uh, so I started studying psychology and halfway through the program, I, I really uh, don't know if this says good things about me as a person, but I would hear my friends and colleagues and people telling me these stories and you know they'd say things like oh thanks for listening trisha there that was very therapeutic you made an insightful comment and i would sit there in the back of my head just going like i can't do this for a living uh i, I need you to tell me a more interesting story uh <laughs> if i'm gonna hear story after story after story every day i need the stories to be more interesting so that's when i switched into psychology of creativity because i just care very much about people's cathartic experience and, and them having like an insightful experience. Uh, but I also need it to be entertaining for me as well. Um, <laughs> so I don't know what that says about me exactly. Not the most altruistic reason to do this, but that's, uh, that's where we're at. And, you know, I hope that it has helped people to not only create better writing, but also, um, you know, to create writing that more people want to listen to. So I, I think it's beneficial. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, that's one of the, the things that's so important about poetry. And I, I don't know if you read the interview with uh, James Pennebaker at the University of Texas from Rattles uh, issue 74, I think that was in. Are you familiar with his no, work? About, but um... I have cited him many times. <laughs> uh, I did not know that you had done an interview with him. And uh, I'm 
really looking forward to listening to it. Yeah, well, I'll send you um, I'll send you the the copy of the issue that that's in for sure. But um, yes, please. But what he you know he what happened? What's really interesting with him is he quantified that and and actually had studies yes. that that found that that if you um, if you give students either an expressive writing exercise where they're investigating some kind of you know deep aspect of their own life story. Um, versus a, a group of control group that's just writing some random thing that doesn't matter, the the people who write about the you know freshman college students who write about their traumatic or, or important experiences end up like sleeping better, going to the you know sick you know going to the health office less frequently, getting better grades, a whole bunch of metrics that actually show that just a little bit of a session of writing creative creatively about your own experience has so many healing powers, which is the great thing about about creative writing. And people always talk about it's one of the things I ask about on the show a lot is 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 writing a kind of um, a, um psychology? Is it kind of like catharsis? Is it like and and I think the answer is clearly yes. Some people say no, it's not therapy. But uh but I think it clearly is. And so I think you would probably agree, right? Um I have a complicated answer, but but uh you know as a roundabout way of saying this, um with with James Pennebaker, I think I started looking at his work mainly because of an author, uh, Luis De Salvo, who wrote a book called How Writing Heals. Mm -hmm. And she um, she mentions his work and she cites his work. And I, I remember in her book, she says something like, you know, Pennebaker found that writing can help but it can also hurt if done incorrectly or, you know, if not done in a special way. And I thought, oh, my God, have I been doing it wrong? Have I been <laughs> harming people or getting people to harm themselves? So I looked at these guidelines that she uh, laid out that I think were based on his work. And fortunately, they're the they're like 101 of creative writing. Um, and I, I think. And please do check this out yourself, all you future uh you know, psychology students and whatnot. But I believe what he said is something along the lines of, um, you know, if you're just writing and stewing on a problem and just saying over and over, you know, my life is terrible. My life is terrible. This person is terrible. I, I have been wrong, you know, and you're just really digging deep with it. Um, that's going to hurt. And that's going to make things worse for you if you're just ruminating. Uh, what will make you feel better is if you are looking at the imagery in the room if you're looking at how uh, the experience isn't just something static, but is something that you move through, is something that is caused by an event, and therefore you're a little less um, culpable in it, you're a little less uh, rooted in the problem. So it's like, I was fine, everything was great, this person came in and punched me in the face and that's why I punched them back. It was transitory, <laughs> it was a cause and effect situation. Um, and I thought that's great. These are the things you teach in creative writing. Like in, in poetry, we teach the Volta. Okay. So if you're going to sit there and talk about how terrible something is, well, you need the Volta then to like shift you out of that, hopefully. Right. So I, I really think that, yeah, to the question is poetry therapy is therapy poetry. Um, I think that we can take some of the things that we know about how to make better writing uh, and and those questions can apply to us in terms of, of asking, you know, how do I make better thinking, better feeling, right? So it's not um, an either or situation. I think we're asking the wrong question. The, the questions are, you know, how can we use poetic techniques or creative writing techniques to help us have a better therapeutic experience? How can we use therapeutic techniques to have us help us have a better uh, experience of our creative writing and our creative lives in general. Um, so, you know, it's not a binary, it's a big circle. It's a big interconnected spider web of, uh, of cause and effect there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I love you pointing out the, the importance of the Volta because that is something that, you know, if a poem is going to be transformative, it has to have a sense of transformation. It has to go from one place yeah. to another. And if it doesn't, it doesn't work. So on the critique of the week that we always do um, so often, I'll say, well, this poem, you know, just doesn't have any kind of arc. There's no there's no movement. It needs a place to go. And, and you know, that's the importance of the Volta in a sonnet uh, and so many other things, too. Um, and, and people who are, are watch this show all the time are going to be tired of me talking about this. But uh, but for me, what I've sort of realized, I think, is that um, I used to think of it in terms of like what the healing actual the actual healing properties of poetry or any kind of creative endeavor are, are bringing bringing what the subconscious knows into the consciousness. 
And so, mm-hmm. and then, so there's, there's all these like problems that we're like gnawing at that we kind of don't have an answer for that we're like wrestling with our whole lives sometimes. And I think that's why, yeah. you know, as a poet, you have these like obsessions and you go after these certain topics because you're trying to like make sense of them. And what poetry does or what any kind of artistic production does is it finds a way to make sense of that thing that you're wrestling with. And I used to think of it as subconscious versus unconscious, but now I've added um, Ian McGilchrist's work on the bi- bifurcated brain. Um, and we interviewed him at the next winner's issue, um, talking about the two hemispheres and how the right hemisphere has this holistic understanding of the world, and the left hemisphere has this uh, very narrowly focused, but that's the verbal hemisphere, and it, that's the emissary that thinks it's the master. And so it thinks yeah. it knows everything, like your verbal brain, that, that sort of where you're conscious, the thoughts in your head are coming from. Um, you know, that thinks it knows everything, but it doesn't know anything. <laughs> and it's the right brain that has all of that deeper understanding. And so the process of creative writing is translating what the right brain knows into the left brain so you can integrate it and become whole again. So that's my sort yes. of thesis for what creative writing does psychologically and why it's actually healing. So what do you think about you know, that? Another, <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say another book you might want to check out is a book called uh, Why God Won't Go Away. Oh, that's great. And um, I'm cannot remember off the top of my head the author's names it's two authors uh i think the subtitle is something like the neurobiology of belief but they have a chapter in there about myth making and what you need to do to create a myth and um again i'm like i'm summarizing this and this is not my area of expertise so please take anything i say with a grain of salt and go um go read the book go read the original but uh but they said something like you know, when you're trying to create a myth or an explanation for why something happens, you have to to satisfy both your intellectual brain and your more emotional brain. You have to have, um, you know, uh, an answer that both makes sense logistically, but also emotionally. And that's when you get the epiphany feeling like, oh, my brains, my two separate brains, they just touched. And now I feel really good. You know, everything is working um, on all synapses. I mean, we could also compare it to Chicksamehi. Uh, it's taken me my entire <laughs> master's degree program to figure out how to pronounce yeah, his I've name. Yeah, I've not learned that um, yet. So I'm going to have to play back this episode several times and, <laughs> and <laughs> learn myself. I, I'm always like that guy with a long name. But anyway. Exactly. <laughs> I, I could be mispronouncing that one too. But um, but yeah, uh, Chicksamehi is studies flow and you know he talks about like how you get into flow which is basically how you get into ecstasy how you get into a feeling of feeling so uh you know satisfied with your work so engrossed so engaged that you know all of you is there it's present you're not thinking about yourself which is ironic because it's like all of you is engaged at the time um and you know it happens in work it happens uh, a lot of poets will say it happens when you're composing a lot of creative anyone will say it's happening you know when you're composing um i think we can all agree it's like not every single minute of the process of composing uh there's plenty of times where you're irritated and distracted and whatever but you know the goal is to get to that phase that stage of it and and that's (laughs) maybe that's the drug that keeps us coming back to you know (laughs) so um i have no idea what your original question was (laughs) Or how we got onto this topic. Well, uh, do you think, I mean, I always think about how, you know, Emily Dickinson said, I know it's a poem when it takes the top of my head off. And, you know, you get yeah. goosebumps. Like, I always feel like I could just read submissions and then be be hooked up to like a, a what's it called? A, the electric, <laughs> you know, like a lie detector test where it measures the electrical resistance on your skin, you know? Yeah. And I could just use that to pick the poems. I could just be reading poems. And then when I get a little like skin sweat is when, oh, that's the poem. They had the most skin sweat of the day. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, but I think what causes that is this like connection between the two two selves that you really are, and yeah. so you know it's like a bridge over that corpus callosum that that has it's like you know like there's like a lightning bolt that like bridges that gap for the first time in a long time about an important topic, and that's why poems or any kind of art really is so powerful, is it because it bridges that gap and lets us see the connection. So I think do you, does that does that concept resonate with you? I guess is my question, given that you come at it similar topic from different maybe angles or theories. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, poetry and and writing and the creative process, so very mysterious. Um, I went and got a master's degree in humanistic psychology with a specialization in creativity studies. And, you know, a lot of the books out there are still saying, um, well, this is theory and and we're not, we can't 
determined for sure and it's impossible to know. So so it is impossible to know, but I like knowing. Me too. <laughs> uh, which means I'm perpetually thwarted. Um, but I, I like what the study in this program uh, has kind of given me like some general rules, some general guidelines, some general understanding of how things work. So I can't force it all the time. I can't make it happen. I can't like go to the fridge and, you know, open a bottle of inspiration and know that it's going to work all the time. But I feel like I have a lot more sense of control over the process than I did, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I started writing poetry. Um, so I, I don't, believe that it's 100 percent mysterious i think there's method i mean that's why the book i think there is method i think there is mystery mm -hmm. well let's see i want to make sure we do uh i want to get through all the poems too so let's do another poem and then we'll, <laughs> we'll talk more okay yeah great um so this one is also i i selected the selection of poems that um won the Pangea Prize because they, they had asked for seven poems and then you asked for eight poems. And I thought, well, I'll just choose those seven. Uh, and then the one that was selected in Rattle. So that made it, <laughs> made it really easy to decide. Um, this next one, I believe uh, in, in the book that's coming out from Pine Row, I believe the title of it is Eclipse. Uh, but the original title was The Basket of the Sky Gluts Itself on Stars. No matter how fast the city grows, darkness takes us back to our place. Each constellation, a collection of seeds, gloamed around the root of its growling. I lucubrate, listening to the nocturnes and the benighted sounds of moths alighting among night-dwelling animals. Lions roost near Cassiopeia. Poets follow the feet of the bear. Now a comet flings itself from the collision with daylight. The hubcap of a cherry breaks from a junkyard of promises. Once we were spotted, wild ponies spattered with silver, toughening its hair. When I look at you, a privacy, like the privacy of first people. God hadn't found us yet. We plucked our light out of a river, then the moon appeared, a lantern lifted, stars raised their cold mouths to howl at us, the blue-green animal scratching its scent into the dangerous sky. Yeah, another great poem, and that was, um, that was, um, the basket of the sky guts itself on stars. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so tell me about, I guess, uh, we should talk about the poetry salon. Um, and, and that's one of those mm -hmm. things that I see it all over the place. There are workshops, there's so much stuff going on. Um, and it's kind of feels a little bit like Rattle where, where with Rattle though, I can say, oh, it's a poetry magazine and it makes it easy, even though we do so much more stuff than that. And the poetry salon in a similar way yeah. does so much more than that. So how do you characterize what you do and, and why did you find it, found it? Like what, uh, what is it and how did it come to be? Yeah. I mean, that's a long story. So the short version I think is that, um, yeah, I wanted to study creative writing more, and I had already gotten my uh, undergrad degree in um, English and uh, modern literary studies with a minor in performing arts. And, um, you know, I think my whole life I've kind of been at war with wanting to do something really meaningful that helps people and helps the world. And I've also just wanted to be a ham who's on stage and... Uh, you know, indulging in this really pleasurable activity of making the arts happen. And so I I went and I got this master's degree in psychology and then halfway through just basically said, yeah, I, I can't. I'm sorry. Uh, I have to I have to follow writing instead. And so by the time I was done with that, I had a lot of knowledge about how you write and how you can like you know, control sort of control the writing process. Um, but I was not going to go get a master's degree in creative writing. Um, I already had too much debt from student loans and I just was not going to go spend more time getting, getting further into debt. 
uh, or just, you know, being a student uh, longer. And um, and I started taking classes with Kim Adonizio and boy, just taking her classes, it was like, this is exactly what I want from life. I want to sit down in a room full of really smart uh, other poets and write and and then talk in depth about each word and why it's there and what it's doing and create deep friendships with other writers. And so um, shortly after that, I moved to LA and there were some wonderful workshops, but I didn't think there were enough critique groups that were really doing the kind of in-depth um, feedback that I got from Kim's workshop. Maybe there were, and I just didn't find them. So I, I really don't want to, uh, you know, insult any of the other writing teachers who are here. I just didn't find them. Um, and so um, Alexis Round Fancher, who I know you know, uh, she suggested that we start a group that was devoted to um, editing and the craft. And, uh, and she got together a group of poets and we had a wonderful six weeks sitting around uh, my living room in Culver City and talking about poetry in depth. And uh, basically, I just knew that was the only thing I wanted to do. And um, and then COVID happened and became an entirely online organization after that. And it's evolved and it's had many different iterations. And, and you know, we're frequently adding bells and whistles. And sometimes we're saying like, oh, that whistle just doesn't whistle right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we're sometimes contracting bells and whistles too. Um, you know, but I really like to respond to what poets want and need. So if I'm finding like, oh, you know, everyone's asking this question about metaphor i'll create a whole workshop on metaphor everyone's asking this question about point of view i'll create a whole workshop on point of view and it's just continued as a result of me hearing what people need thinking about what um i can offer and as i grow they grow as they grow i grow so it's just been this wonderful kind of you know co-evolving organization so now now the basic form i mean they're podcast right so you can listen to all these conversations at the poetry salon.com yes yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've listened to a few and, and always enjoyed them. And you have so many great poets in addition to yourself on the show. Um, it's really fun. So I recommend everybody check that out. Um, but I'll talk about more about that. But let's do another poem so we don't forget poems because this is a poetry yes, of podcast. Course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on that note, though, I do also want to say the last one that I read uh, that's now currently called Eclipse. That one got started in a workshop with Gustavo Hernandez who wrote the book Flower Grand First, and we interviewed him on the podcast, and then he taught a workshop on the nocturnes um, with us in conjunction with the Poetry Salon. So thank you to Gustavo. That poem definitely, uh, I don't think, ever would have been written without his guidance. So thank you to him for that. Uh, this next one is called When the Moon Had Antlers. And that one has also changed its title. So in the book, it's going to be appearing, I think, under uh, the title When We First Named It. But right now it's When the Moon Had Antlers. Moss glowed on rock. The hunter moon hung its horn from a cloud. Men rose from the rivers, green. On the banks, the stag muddied their antlers. We drank with ripple shine, star gardens, workmanship of a knife turning stone into fish, fins, faces. Now we stand facing the old statues, asking, where have they led us, the people we once were, the artists, all the gods we animals have made? Yeah, and that is uh, the title poem, even though the title's changing uh, from the book, uh, When the Moon Had Antlers. Um, mm -hmm. And so can you tell me about, about, about that, about uh, why you decided to make that the title of the book, but not the title of the poem? <laughs> yeah, so that one, I mean, that one's got a complex evolution to it as well. Um, yeah, the, when the moon had antlers is definitely one of those lines that came to me in a flash. I didn't, I don't, you know, conscious mind, unconscious mind, what have you. Um, I hadn't overthought that one too much and then i'm sure i gave it to a couple of different uh folks to help me edit it and um someone suggested that be the title and uh yeah and i mean the uh, the other title of the book was um the pleasures of the bear 
And I, I really like that as well, but we took a vote on it in a class that I was taking with Kelly Grace Thomas, also friend of the, the pod. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and the vote was definitely, uh, when the moon had antlers. And then, um, yeah, the reason I changed the title of the poem again is one, I'm just very indecisive. Uh, and I don't remember what else it was. I, I, I'm sure there was a logic to it at some point. I think I wanted people to discover that line in the poem about, you know, there was a time when the moon had antlers. I didn't want them to get that from the title. So I think that's why I changed it so mm -hmm. that the, just the title wouldn't, the title of the poem wouldn't give it away. Yeah. Well, I think those are all great choices. It makes a great title for the book. And then I do agree with the, you know, finding the best line buried there as always, especially when it's like the title of the book and you get to that, you know, book title and you're like, oh, there's this like, feeling of when you have the, the line from the title buried in the poem that you didn't see coming that I, I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to, to provide that experience, I think. Um, so, so with the poetry salon, I mean, we talked about the, the healing powers of poetry and, and the, and the method and mystery, this textbook that you've written basically about, um, a prompts in your practice at the poetry salon. Um, it really, what I love about it is it really focuses on process and rather yeah. than product. And so what is it about the, the process of writing that, that makes you want to focus on that rather than, you know, I wrote this book of poems that I'm really proud of that won these awards. Why is it the process that, that matters? Well, so when we study the psychology of creativity, we're focusing on the three P's. Um, unless I'm leaving one out, it might be the four P's. But but it's process, product, and the personality of the, the person who's doing it. And, uh, you know, the process is the joy of it, I think. Uh, Anne Lamott will say that in Bird by Bird. Anne Lamott has said that, written that in Bird by Bird. Um, I think every writer will tell you it's it's the process that's really the reward. And I would say there's different parts of that process too. You know, there's different aspects of it. Um, you know, there's that moment when you're writing and you really get in control of your subject or you feel like some kind of power coming through you and you just feel great uh, when you're, when you're composing. Um, I think that is just something we all want. We all want it, you know, all the time. And that's what keeps us coming back. Um, but that you also can experience that when you're reading a poem, you know, when you're reciting it, when you're learning it by heart, as uh, Kim Rosen, one of my mentors, would say, um, and and sharing it with others. Um, you know, this is a little, again, beyond my pay grade, but some of the psychology around how poetry heals to suggest that it is the sharing with others that's a big part of the healing process because... You know, as with everything else, um, I think I can pretty much I think I can pretty much say this with some confidence. But like having friends makes for a happier, healthier life. <laughs> yeah, and so. uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I think most of the research bears that out. Right. And and there's people who know nothing about poetry who will still say having friends and having strong community connections uh, it has a positive effect on your life. Right. So. Um, so, yeah, I think to me that's part of the process as well i might have a really bad day of writing at the poetry salon where i don't feel super thrilled with whatever i wrote but then i listen to something someone else wrote i'm hearing them uh, i'm hearing other members of the poetry salon um you know develop their craft or they're having a breakthrough or they're not, and they're bitching about how hard the writing was. And I can bitch about how the hard the writing was for me that day too. And like, I really feel like my writer friends know me in a way that other people in my life won't. And I know them in a way that probably other people in their lives don't know them, you know? Like talking with even my therapist, you know, I'll tell her about how hard the day was, but she doesn't know how deeply I love daffodils. Never come up in conversation with her comes up at the poetry salon all the time. Like those people know how I feel about daffodils. They know me on a much deeper level than anyone else will. Cause you know how you feel about daffodils or the other things you're obsessed with. Like in a way that can define you much more than your anxiety about your bank account. So, you know, I think that I have much happier, healthier, deeper friendships because I write and share with other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so to me, that's part of the process and the joy of doing it as well. 
Yeah, it's interesting too. I mean, that that idea of sharing is so important. I think it's because, and it's something that I don't think Pennebaker's touched. You know, which mm-hmm. would be great if if him or one of his students did. Um, you know, if you you know compared sh- someone who shared those stories that they wrote down, that you know the, the expressive writing with somebody else, how would they be even more improved than somebody who kept it and you know shredded it up like he encourages people to do, so they'll feel open, you know, so they'll feel open about it. He encourages people to just tear it up and throw it away after. But I wonder if sharing it because there's something about um having a container for your problems, for your mm-hmm. for your anxieties or your fears or your hopes or your dreams or whatever, and having some kind of container lets you have control about it because you can carry your container and you can pass it around and you can look at it. And yeah. there's a way that it's like outside of you and not buried deep inside when you have a poem to, to hold it. And so I think that's a big part of it. Well, and I think um, also it, I, I just want to caution people too. Uh, it's very important to have an appropriate container <laughs> and to have <laughs> a, an appropriate group. I think, you know, I know people, um, this is horrible, but I, I do know a lot of people who will come to the poetry salon, you know, in later years, uh, in their life and say like, yeah, I, I got into writing when I was like 10, but someone said something mean. So I stopped for, you know, most of my life. Um, so, you know, I do understand why some people would not want to immediately start sharing. I, I wouldn't cause I wouldn't advise that, you know, you write something deeply meaningful and vulnerable and then like, you know, throw it to the masses because uh, that there could be a lot of negativity around that, too. So, you know, find your your sympathetic audience, uh, find a trained poet to sit there and listen to you with their heart open and hopefully taking some of the judgment out of it. Um, so, you know, just just that caveat so people don't go endanger themselves, you know, just by showing their poems to anyone on the street. Yeah, that safe space is so important. And I think I, I think you mentioned, do you work with Ellen Bass at some point? Um, I was so lucky that we had Ellen Bass on uh, the Poetry Salon okay, cast. Okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking um, of, yeah. Yeah, um, I don't think I've ever technically taken her classes, but I have learned so much from her. Uh, and she's just one of the nicest people on earth mm-hmm. um you know not that it's a competition but she would <laughs> no. probably write really yeah she high. definitely is and she wrote the courage to heal which is a similar book on an yeah. imp- this important topic and um and i took a class with her i took a workshop in mallorca spain which was like the luckiest week of my life it was so great <laughs> but the thing that was amazing about her workshop was that the, the way she created a safe space and by like day three she was asking people to write about the most the thing that you're most ashamed of you know, and I mm. actually did. Uh, a po- I've never shared anywhere else, uh, but I wrote the, a poem. I've, I've, you know, a few people have read it, but not many. And, um, and and somehow she created this safe space where you could like dig deep into that, like whatever that is, whatever you like need to say that you haven't ever said. And I think that's something reading your book uh, Method and Mystery that you try to do in your workshops too. So so how do you go about creating a safe space? And 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 can you speak a lot to the importance of that? Because that really does seem key. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I definitely can't take full credit for this. And I've had some interesting experiences because uh, right now we attract a lot of diverse students. Uh, We attract a lot of students who have been writing for a long time and really want to have in-depth discussions about craft. And I think they come kind of prepared, you know. Uh, you can say on day one, hey, uh, you don't know me, you don't know anyone else here, but uh, write about your most embarrassing secret. And they're like, yeah, I, I know how to do that. I know how to share and I'm not going to get embarrassed, you know. Um, but we do have sometimes new students who have never written before and or, you know, never shared before or, you know, still feel uncomfortable. And um, yeah, I, it's a number of things. I mean, one is I tell people that uh they don't have to write something great something i i love saying to people is like look you can go to you can go to um a journal or you can go to a bookstore you can buy a poem a book of poems that are heavily crafted and thought through and well written but only here in the workshop do we get to see each other's messy first drafts there's something really special about that you know and i want to hear your your unfinished poem um, I really do. And, and then, you know, something that, uh, my friend and one of my first poetry teachers, Brendan Constantine told me, um, after I got a push cart nomination, 
I was getting real in my head and I was like, how do I, oh God, how do I get another push cart nomination? And uh, I couldn't write for a while. And I wrote to him just like, help. Uh, and he, he says something like, you know, remember your worst writing is always ahead of you and go out and try to write something intentionally bad. Uh, so I tell poets like, you know, just whoever writes the worst draft wins. Um, I really want you to write something terrible and you get more respect from me if you feel vulnerable enough or brave enough to share your bad writing. So I, I try to make that really the, the point of the exercise. So it's not only is it okay, but it's like value that you're sharing something unfinished that takes a lot of bravery. Um, and then also they just see each other sharing. They see each other sharing and they see everyone else in the room, like being nice and supportive. And I think, um, you know, if they don't want to share on the first day or the second by, you know, the third or fourth time they come to the poetry salon, they're like, okay, I know this is a safe place. I've seen other people be safe here, be held. So, um, so, you know, I would say to writing teachers, I've heard this many times, but there will often be students who won't share for, you know, a session, two sessions, a month. And then one day they're ready and they share and then they take over the class, you know? So like, you don't, I don't think you have to force it. I don't, I wouldn't advocate anyone force it. That's also another big part of setting a safe space. Yeah. It's so interesting that advice It's great advice to write bad poems. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, I love, I fell in love similar to you, like toward the end of uh, my undergraduate uh, time, you know, I was in sciences and then I fell in love with writing poems. It was just so much, so fun to do exactly what you say that, that whole, just, just picking things apart and discovering new things you didn't know you knew. And then, and then like playing with poems and trying to make them work. Mm -hmm. And it was just so fun compared to everything else that was so boring. And then, so I continued doing that and just having so much fun with it. And then I ended up having a job in poetry and I ended up having a book <laughs> And then after the book came out, I was like, oh, God, this is serious. Like, people are going to read the poems I write. And, like, I'm trying to, like, make them good. And that's that just ruined it for years. It was yeah, so hard. Yeah. And I kind of, to be honest, I kind of blamed it on my kids because I had, like, young kids at the time. And I was like, oh, it's their fault. But the truth is, I was just, my ego was, like, so in the way of, like, trying to actually make poems good instead of just making yeah. poems. And it took a long time to figure out how to get past that. Yeah, that's the hardest part. And that's the thing that I, you know, think is a mantra, too, is just like, look, um, I used to take workshops with Jack Grapes, uh, uh, Method Writing, and I love Jack and I love his writing. And I please everyone go get the book Method Writing. Uh, it's definitely a game changer. Um, but when I was in his workshop, and I was a seasoned writer, I knew better, but I couldn't help it. Like, I get an assignment, let's say on a Wednesday. So Wednesday night, I'd go home and I'd write and Thursday, I'd write and Friday, I'd write and Saturday, I'd write. And then, you know, like Tuesday night, I'd write the thing that I wound up sharing in class because, you know, those other six days I was preening, I was posturing, I was trying to show the class how good I was. And it wasn't until after I got through all that BS that, you know, the real thing would come through. And I know that I, you know, I have a degree in that now, but getting past all that, knowing that that's what you're doing. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know. You're like, I'm being authentic, really being authentic. And it's not until later you're like, no, I was lying. <laughs> I was definitely lying. Yeah. Yeah. Checkers <laughs> you know? calls it the, uh, the deep voice, I think. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to find it really quickly. A quote. We have a great quote somewhere. Where did I even put that quote? Um, but, but he talks about that, 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 that sort of like, I don't know, some kind of like archaic, like deep down grunty kind of thing that comes up and you can't even control it. And that's what you're searching for in writing. And, um, yeah. and, and how do you, I mean, the question is, how do you find that? How do you get through? So it doesn't have to take seven days. Cause I think you'd say probably by now, you know how not to do that. You know, you know, you can write a poem in a workshop that you like. So how do you, how do you, and that's what you teach in this method and mystery, yes. how to get to that mystery that we don't really quite understand. Is it the right brain? Is it the subconscious? Is it the, you know, God speaking through our veins? What is it? Who knows? But however it is, you figure out how to get to it in your classes. So what is your advice to, to get to that mental space? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, um, you know, I, I, I hope I gave a, a better description in um, Method and Mystery in the book. Uh, and it'll be different things on different days. 
I think, um, and different things with different poems, different topics. Uh, there is unfortunately no one size fits all, but I will definitely say two things that are the most helpful. And one I think is that you want to get into a truth telling voice. So if you're trying to write a poem about something really big, your, you know, your whole relationship with your mother, how you feel about God, um, the war that's going on, uh, that can get really hard. Try just describing what's in the room for a few minutes. Try saying what's, what's absolutely true and provable. Um, I like that. I really like doing that because if nothing else, like it connects you to a part of your voice that is not trying to BS, right? So it's like, I forget what day this is, it's Monday, right? Uh, I'm talking with Tim Green on Rattle. Uh, there's a cup of tea next to me. Uh, look, I can talk. I can like, I can write these things down. The apparatus is working. Now I can go somewhere else uh, with it. Um, I often also credit uh, uh, the line, listen, I want to tell you something ordinary, which comes from a poem by Brendan Constantine. And I think those are some really good rules. Like, listen, you want to get the reader's attention, then you can tell them something ordinary and don't try to impress them too much. You know, like, listen, it's Monday talking with Tim, um, you know, uh, outside there's rose bushes flowering, you know, and probably some birds in the trees. Right. So um, that's just getting into the normal sensory perception, too. Um, so so that's helpful. And then I would say the other really useful thing, if that's not working, if you've got a poem that, you know, is just not working and you can't figure out why uh, I love meta poems write about why you can't write about it write about why this poem isn't working um i had a wonderful experience like 10 years ago i was trying to to write um do a do a workshop on gratitude and i instructed everyone you know write about what you're grateful for and i think i maybe threw in there or maybe she did it on her own i said like you know if you don't want to do that you know you can switch topic um, but but somebody wrote a poem about why she couldn't write about gratitude. She's like, I got too much bad, bad stuff going on right now. I got this. I got that. And she just wrote this great rant about everything going on in her life that was preventing her from feeling gratitude. And it was a really vibrant poem. And it definitely instructed me. I just thought that, yes, I'm going to tell students from here on out if they don't want to write about the topic or they're having trouble write about why they can't write about the topic or why they don't want to write about this topic that unleashes some stuff, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I would say those two things are probably the most useful tools that I have that, oh, like at least seven times out of 10 will get people out of a rut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, yeah. And that's what it's all about really is, is finding that, that place inside yourself where you're telling the truth. I think, um, I'll, I'll read this quote cause this is from, uh, the interview with Jack grapes in rail number 15, mm -hmm. which is out of print, but it's in, um, it's in our conversations anthology too. to find it though. I had to pull this up from my terribly old blog. So old that, um, the um the the characters don't work so all the other quotes and stuff have like weird i really got to fix that but anyway this is what Chet grapes says about it. i'll just read this this paragraph as so i began to write more seriously in college i realized there was something missing in my work i remember picking up a book by thomas wolf a short story called the lost boy and i heard a tone uh, i don't want to say a voice because people think voice means character of a person or personality it doesn't a voice is a tone it's the tone of a violin, the tone of a cello. It's the tone of a trumpet, depending on what the notes are and who's playing them. I heard this tone, this deep note, and it vibrated inside of me. I realized that when I read the great poetry, that deep voice is what I hear, that tone that lies beneath the words. That's why I can read Shakespeare, Proofrock, in a coffee shop, and all the noise goes away, the traffic, people talking, the clanking of dishes. All I hear is the sound of that bow being pulled across the strings of a cello, like the moan of a human being sitting in a room at two in the morning. I heard that sound, and I knew that that's the sound a poet must be able to get to. It doesn't exclude the higher-pitched notes or the more frenetic syntax and diction, Without that deep tone, it's just scribbling. 
And I do love that quote from Jack. And that's really what your whole book, The Method and Mystery, is getting at and helping people get through. That's what the Poetry Salon does. And, um, and that's really why the process is so valuable, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, um, as I hear myself talking, <laughs> too, I realize, like, you know, when I say just sit down and describe what's going on in the room, it's actually very similar to Jack's, uh, you know, first lesson, which is write like you talk. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I both of my parents are visual artists. Uh, they they paint and they draw. And so I think for me, I'm very obsessed with images and um, an imagery. So for me, you know, it's kind of a different approach. Like if I just write down what's in the room and I'm probably going to write about it the way I would talk about it, you know, it helps me to kind of ignite that part of my brain. Uh, what am I going to write about? Well, I'm going to write about what's in front of me. Um, but yeah, they're they're kind of like, I don't know. It it's it's doing the same thing I think, which is getting you present and getting you comfortable with yourself and where you are and not trying to front for anyone, not not trying to pose and posture and preen, but just trying to like drop in and get authentic with who you are, where you are at the moment. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what reading submission feels like. It's just listening for that yeah. sound of authenticity and then you, and when you hear it, you know it. You know, and there's no denying it that someone's being honest. And in this world where people are so dishonest all the time and, you know, posing in so many ways on social media, let alone everywhere else we go, um, just a feeling of authenticity and that connection is what we really get out of poetry, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to keep we got to keep doing poems because this is like my, my favorite oh, topic okay. that you like. And so I could talk about it all day. But let's do another poem. And then I should say, too, if anybody has any questions for Tricia, I'll leave them in the chat window, either on Facebook or YouTube. And I will pass uh, some questions along as well. But let's hear another poem, Tricia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, this is Catacombs. This is how we remember what we love. Build a city over it. Rearrange skulls into fountains, bones into tourist attractions. We see ourselves ushered into the underworld. See the statues hold still. Time has transmogrified them into questions. Remember the moon once had antlers and loved us so much she buried her light in our bones. Yeah, great little poem with a callback to the title, too. Uh, Catacombs. Yeah, excellent work there. Yeah. Um, there In fact, I think. Yeah. um, I, I just I think that's why I had to change the title of the other one, because originally it was one poem. I broke it into two. And the first poem didn't have that reference to the moon with antlers. So I was like, I got to give that another <laughs> title. And then the other one did have that reference. And I didn't want to, um, I wanted the reader to discover it in the context of the poem. So that's why I changed the title on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, there's a great question here from Nietzsche, going back to the, the healing power of poetry. Um, he asks, are there studies in the, psych- the psychology of people who produce work in a single sitting versus those who edit, rewrite, and we work, rework to no end? Um, if there are no studies, do you have any thoughts on that? Is, is the editing process part of the healing too? Which is something I'm not really quite sure about either because I tend to write you know, poems in one sitting and then never go back again. So I don't even know if I feel that way. But, but what do you think? And I think I'm trying to think of what Pen and Baker said, because I might have asked him about this, but let me uh, let me uh, ask you your opinion. Well, that's, that. the, that's the thing. I mean, I think, unfortunately, there has been this big divide between poetry as therapy versus poetry as art. Um, and people, unfortunately, I think, get into different camps. And it's it's a shame they should be talking to each other. They have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, but um, I, I don't know about that specifically. I will say every poet that I've talked to on the Poetry Salon cast, we ask... Um, multiple questions but one of them is which of these poems in your book came easily which one of them uh were difficult to write um so i think every poet i know has some poems that come down very quickly and you know they're called done poems and they're like given to you because they they show up um and then every poet i know has a poem that they took multiple multiple times multiple times uh, of sitting down in different sittings to write you know, so I will just say from my own personal experience, it's it's really, you know, hard to quantify um, what what are your best poems, because that's so subjective. Um, but I will say, like, I think my most successful poems are the poems that have like gotten to really good journals or the poems that have won some prizes and stuff 
I have one that I know I worked on like just 8,000 times, so many drafts of it. And, and it's the one that won the Robert and Adele Schiff poetry prize, a walk through the parking lot at midnight, that poem, just every night I would walk around the suburbs in San Jose and I'd take notes and I didn't know what I was trying to say. And, you know, at one point I brought it into an editing class where it was three pages long and, and the teacher just looked at me and said, like, I think we need to have a rule about how long a poem can be to bring it into this class. Um, and then it, it got worked down to like, uh, you know, I, I don't even know how many lines, but I think it's like probably sonnet sized, you know, it's like 14, 15 lines. So that one took a lot of work um, and won a prize. So yay. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, some of my other poems, um, which one do I want to draw on here? Like, you know, the first, I, I think in fact, oh, oh, I'm just realizing this now, but I think every I think every one of the poems I've had that was nominated for a push cart um, came out like kind of in one sitting. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, trimmed around the edges. But for the most part, it was there in one sitting. Um, so that's, you know, I, I think there's different ways. I don't think there's necessarily a difference. But I will say the poems that take the most work, I think, are probably the poems where you learn the most about yourself as a writer, mm -hmm. as a person, you know, um, writing the, the one that uh, won the Adele shift poetry prize, the, um, uh, walk through the par parking lot at midnight. Like I learned a lot about poetry by wrestling with that poem and failing many times. Mm -hmm. And I really need to say thank you to Sally Ashton, who wrote an essay on the free line poem because finding that essay and that lesson is what allowed me to finish that poem. And that's an exercise that I use over and over and that I love teaching and love doing. So like, you know, I think I gained a lot from, from working so hard on that one, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, to, to answer, I think, um, um, to answer Nate's question, uh, Penny Baker talked about when I asked him a similar question, he talked about just what you mentioned briefly earlier, which is that he's worried about people who fixate on a certain thing. Like the whole point is to move past you know, the problem because the, the real maybe even the entire reason why it's healing to get these you know expressive writing out is because you don't have to mull over stuff. So you sleep better. You have better dreams. You have you don't have that sort of constant anxiety from the problem that's not solved that you're like like sitting on for so long. Um, and so he would say that if you, um, you know, if, if you're mulling on something too long, you're actually causing a bigger problem. And so he, the point is to move past it. But I think he's actually wrong <laughs> because I think, mm, um, mm. I, I think that if you're discovering new things about yourself, if you're moving stuff from the subconscious to the conscious yeah. mind, whether it's in the revision process or the writing process, the initial draft process, either way, if you're learning something about yourself or your view of the world that you didn't really articulate yet, then that's healing because that's what the healing really is, is to understand yourself better. And so I would say yeah. that, that if you're doing that in the revision process, it works too. Yeah. And also, um, you know, coming from the artistic point of view, it's also really great for generating a book, you know, because then you have like all of these poems on a similar theme. Um, and also like, come on, we're poets. You get one page, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to flesh out all your feelings about any one topic in one page. Like I think poets definitely um, get to, to write multiple poems on a subject in terms of like ruminating on the poem itself though i will say taking a break is a great idea if you're stuck on something put it aside for a day a week a month a year learn more techniques about writing uh find the essay that's going to help you unlock it you know and then come back to it later so you know there's like there's poems that i started years ago that I haven't finished or sent anywhere, but um, you know, one day I live in perpetual hope that I'm going to find some exercise that really teaches me what I needed to know to finish that poem. Or maybe I just get more perspective as a human being, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I find something that's going to really help me um, change my mind or admit I was lying, you know, 10 years ago. And, and the line that I need is not like, you know, um, I love this, but actually, you know, secretly I really hate it. You know, so, uh, so yeah, I think the writing process 
you don't need to ruminate on a poem over and over. Get some distance, get some clarity. When it comes to your topics and your obsession, there's a quote, and I, I don't know who to attribute this to, but it's like, when you're going through hell, keep going. And at the poetry salon, writers will often say like, you know, hey, sorry, I'm still writing about this topic. I know I should get over it. And I, I really want to assure you, if it's coming up, you're not that's okay keep following it one it means you're probably gonna have a, a series of poems and that'll help you generate a book so like you know <laughs> that's that's one reason why you do it um but also like yeah i would like to hope that we're learning more things i would hope that uh shoveling it out is going to ultimately help you if it keeps coming up and you're just ignoring it i don't think that's gonna help either so um some advice that I've given in the past to others and to myself too is like, okay, you're going to keep writing heartbreak poems. Fine. Not going to stop you from doing that. But like, can you also try to write a poem about, you know, um, Hollyhock? Um, doesn't mean you can't write negative poems or you can't write poems that all, but just, I want to challenge you to write like one poem on a new subject. <laughs> so that's a good way to compromise, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that comes back to the Volta, too. You know, if you're writing poems without some kind of transformation in it, then you're going to be stuck in that one place. But if you're writing yeah. transformative poetry that moves from one place to another, then you're you're always kind of discovering and moving and, and grappling your way around the healing process, I think. Um, let's see. So, so uh, Carla Schwartz asks here, how do you approach writing over and over about the same topic versus writing essentially the same poem each time? Which is definitely a... a an issue um you know so so how do you how do you avoid that um well one i i probably don't actually uh i write a lot of poems that do sound the same and and i get kind of frustrated with myself um i will say when i finished writing um my my first chap book and it was accepted uh take this longing i just knew that like every poem I wrote ended with the moon or stars or the night sky. And uh, yeah, and it's funny because I'm not even a night owl, you know, but I just really like those words. I like those images. So I did kind of impose a rule on myself that I could only write about things that happened in daylight hours. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and I think that can be so, so useful is like give yourself some some kind of limit or some kind of challenge to do something different. Uh, I, I also will say though, if you are writing on the same topic over and over, um, I really, really enjoy uh, looking at the hero's journey, which we can also call the heroine's journey. Um, there's also another kind of flip side to that. Uh, the virgin's promise which i think is um pioneered by kim hudson mm -hmm. um but you know these are uh you know the mythological kind of archetypal steps that almost every character goes through and um i think you can kind of impose that on poetry i read a lot of poetry books and i'm i'm thinking like hey this is where they're confronting the dragon this is a poem about their friendship this is a poem where they've been like really nice this whole time, but this is the poem where they show that they're really angry, you know? And, um, and I teach a workshop on that. Uh, it's called build the backbone of your book. And it's about taking those topics and uh, kind of walking through the different stages of them. Um, or if you wanted to think of it in a less linear way, it's like, what are the different emotional aspects of them? So like, let's just say we're, you know we're writing about um i don't know tulips oh well yeah i don't think i know this book well enough to use it as an example right but you know like louise gluck's book um the wild iris that's right yeah mm -hmm. the yeah. wild iris mm -hmm. you know i mean it's all poems that are from the point of view of different flowers but they're all different flowers and like they all have different things that they say in different conclusions so I have to look at the book again, but I, I bet you there's poems in there that end on a more hopeful note. There's poems that end on a despairing note. There's probably some poems that are a little angry. Like we're, we're looking at the full spectrum of emotions, but through this one topic. So, you know, let's say you're 
poem is whales, like blue whales, because that's what my first book was. Um, you got to ask, like, what what makes you happy about them? What makes you sad about them? When do you get angry? Uh, what other feelings are there? Happy, sad, you know, like, just make sure that you have kind of expressed all the different feelings around a similar topic or mm -hmm. through that motif. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good advice. Yeah. Um, the, the hours flown by, but let's do, if you don't, if you're not in a rush to go anywhere, let's do two more poems and a little bit of talking yeah. in between. So, so the second to last poem next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Questions for a search engine. If only you could sing me a star song like the bards used to do. Layers of history sediment over, languages lose themselves, and under the man-made lake something lurks, lying dormant. If only you could predict the past like a soothsayer, break open like oracle bones. On this side of the flowers, the tea leaves keep falling. Tell me what animal my grandmother has become now she blossoms celestial side. Tell me why we left the fire unattended, why we ochred our hands on walls. I dream forests walking towards us. What do these images signify? Tell me how this star song ends. Tell me what was written on the back of their eyes. And that was questions for a search engine. Um, a great yeah. poem there uh, for for AI too. I'd love to hear AI's answers to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so let's see. So we haven't really talked about um, uh, your new book yet because it's not quite out yet. Um, yeah. But, but when the moon had antlers, um, was there a certain obsession or a theme that emerged from poems that you? How did that book? How did you decide which poems to go in that book? Because I assume you're the kind of person who's written a lot of freaking poems. So what was yes. it that, that put together the, the poems in that certain, you know, order and then that certain collection of, of various poems? Was there something that wrapped itself around? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'll give you the, the condensed version. But, you know, um, about 10 years ago, I had enough poems for a book. And um, so I was trying to put it together as a book, right? As you do. And uh, I kind of felt like it wasn't, there were a lot of, poems that were good poems but I didn't feel like it really cohered around a similar theme and I kept sending the manuscript out and it kept getting rejected and um the poems individually kept getting accepted so I thought all right like the poems are good maybe it's the way that they're all mushed together that's not working and uh, you know probably after I I don't know eight to ten years it couldn't have been a full ten years but anyways after like a, a very number, very significant number of years uh, and a significant number of rejections, I thought I've written way more poems now. Um, let's look at all the poems I've written and the manuscript and let's see if we can reconfigure some things. And um, I mentioned Kelly Grace Thomas. She is my bosom buddy as far as poetry goes. She offers me lots of great feedback. And, you know, over the years, she would, she's told me some of the poems that I've written are like her favorite. And then I'll be honest, there's sometimes there's poems that I write just for Kelly, you know, <laughs> uh, like it sparks me. I have a genuine interest in a topic or whatever, um, but I'll alter it. And I'm just like, Kelly will like it if I do this, you know, and I, I treasure that about her. She really raises the bar and teaches me new things. So um, at one point, I just kind of looked at the manuscript and I said, these are all the poems that are Kelly's favorite and they should go in one manuscript. These are all the poems that are my favorite and they'll go in another manuscript. And, um, you know, the ones that are my favorite are usually the ones that have to do with nature. There's a really strong image. There's some kind of animal involved. And once I did that, um, I sent it out to Glass Liar Press and it was a finalist for their contest. And I thought, I'm on the right track. This is what I should have done years ago. Uh, and so and so that's like how that book happened, basically. Mm -hmm. is like, you know, all the poems that were somehow involved with nature. I think also history is very much involved. Um, you know, I'm 
the the questions for a search engine i keep thinking about how our life is very different from you know the lives of people who lived in a, a world before there was so much technology and uh you know kind of wondering what happens you know what is the difference between what we can get from technology and what we can't and um you know so so definitely there's a lot of that in there too asking about like primitive cultures and how our own society is built up so that you know how far have we come from what we were at the dawn of time i think mm -hmm. is sort of the obsession of the book yeah yeah very interesting and i think it's just such an important topic too because to me that process that you focus on so much in method and mystery is, is really what we can't get from technology you know, and yeah. I think that's why poetry is such an important future is because we're just going to get more and more enmeshed with technology. And we need the poetry and just the creation of art and the exploration of ourselves without some kind of assistance to tell us what we think is going to be more and more important as we just, you know, everybody has a personal AI assistant that tells us what to think and dress and eat and wear and all that stuff. And so, um, you know, we're going to need poetry more and more. And so that the process of that the poetry salon goes through is just so important, I'd say. Yeah, I'm really not concerned about AI uh, with poetry. I mean, first of all, I think we we're an adaptive species. We'll adapt. There will be there will be carnage, but there will also be like many delightful you know benefits as well. Um, but I, you know, so what if computers can generate all the poetry that we need? Like we write it because it feels good to write it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like we're not gonna stop. And also like. How meaningful is it to read a poem that you know was generated by a computer? We want to know that it was generated by another person. I also think it would be really fun to think of like, uh, all AI poems written by AI, but then also judged by AI and read by AI. Like the computers are going off in their own world, like creating their own like poetry um, economy mm -hmm. that only they are part of. You know, yeah. I... I love this idea that the computers start writing poems to each other. <laughs> yeah, well, to me, it seems like, um, you know, it's going to be that, that, that AI can write poems, you know, can plagiarize beautifully. And so it can write any kind of poems that can pass as poems. And so everyone's going to be faking it. You know, there are going to be so many students faking it and things. And it's going to divide <laughs> the world between people who are, are focused on the product and people who focus on the process. And, and you know, yeah. the people who care about the process and that, that act of self-discovery and, and understanding and, and getting in touch with yourself more, that's the real value. And that just becomes all the more prominent as we can really fake products more and more easily. Well, and I think this is, if I understand it correctly, the way that AI works is it takes everything that's been made and then it synthesizes it. Mm -hmm. um, so it won't be able to create anything new. So like, you know, I don't know if there's a new thing, a new invention in the world, uh, um, a new word that we start using and there hasn't been any usage of that word in the past, I don't know if AI will be able to generate poems about it in the future. Um, could be wrong, very much above my pay grade here, but if that's the case, then we will always need human beings to like, you know, generate mm -hmm. the new material because AI can only recycle it. Um, I mean, you think about it, I and mean, that's what poets are doing anyways. Like none of us, <laughs> like none of we, we're all stealing words out of the dictionary and just rearranging them in new ways. Yeah, and we were all training on you know large language models of all the books of poems we've read. You know, and our, the biggest yeah. advice to poets is always read, read, read. And so, you know, I mean, that's that's what we're doing is we're building our own you know linguistic model of of how poets poems can work and how sentences can be put together. Uh, and so, yeah. you know, there's that aspect of it too. Um, I want to talk about one more thing and we're, we're, we're past time, but I really wanted to ask you about one thing. Cause I do a prompt at the end of every episode, your book method and mystery is like half prompts. It's like so much of it is, yeah. is prompts. So what do you think goes into a good prompt and, and how can I make my prompts better? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, well, okay. I have to credit the book, uh, free play by Steven Nechmanovich. Um, probably one of the most useful books that I encountered in uh, my Psychology of Creativity program. Oh, I also want to give a plug to uh, Michael Tune's book and blog, um, Structure and Surprise. Not part of my Psych of Creativity program, but it's to me like the Bible on the Volta and probably one of the most super useful craft books I've ever used for editing. So um, just, just want to give a shout out there. Um, 
but uh but yeah the um nope Totally lost it. What were we talking about? What was the question? Oh, yeah. Prompts. What prompts? goes into yeah, a good prompt? Yeah, exactly. So Nekmanovich would say in free play that you need two constraints. You need two rules, two things that you are working against or, you know, working towards. Um, and any more than that is going to destroy your creativity. And any fewer constraints is going to give you too much freedom. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, we're we're really like we're very big on freedom. We think how great it is, but like you know, um, I think Catherine Hepburn said like without discipline there is no freedom. So it's like yeah, you you have to have this balance between freedom between having a structure for something and then the openness to be surprised. Uh, but you also have to like have a focal point. And to me, you know, I'm a little all over the place. I think about you know, what I'm eating for dinner while I'm eating breakfast. To me, one of the great benefits of uh, poetry and getting into flow is getting focused. So I really live for prompts. Um, I'm able to write because I have prompts, because I have structure. So if I'm sitting down at my writing desk and going, what do I write about today? There's just 8 million things. What is it that Taoists say? It's like the 10,000 things. Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's the 10,000 things invading my head. But if I sit down and I think, or I get a prompt, or someone gives me a prompt and is like, let's write a sonnet about apples. I will zone out some of those 10,000 things. Um, I'll focus in on one. And then really being able to focus in on that one, that's when I get happy. That's when I can get into flow. Uh, and it's not that like sonnet is important or apples. It's the fact that I've gotten two little, like the, what is it? The bumpers and the bowling oh, yeah. <laughs> alley that just help guide me towards like the singular point of focus. Um, that's, what's really just satisfying about the experience, you know? So, uh, I will give this, and this is kind of something I think William Stafford, did i'm getting it from naomi shihab nye so i you know probably some loss in translation but um he would write down sensory details every morning and then pick a philosophical quote of some kind and then write using sensory details in a philosophical quote i have this variation it's um you know write down some sensory details that are on your mind and that could be stuff you saw yesterday, but it might be the dream you had last night. It might be what you saw on the news. It might be just like an old memory that's come up for whatever reason, whatever's on your mind, but the sensory details of it. And then you pick a, a poem at random, right? So it might be like, you know, open an old copy of rattle and read a poem at random. Um, you know, poem a day, anything like that is really useful. Just pick a poem at random, read it, pick a line from that poem and use it to start your poem, right? Um, if you don't have a book of prompts or you've exhausted them or whatever, this is an endless supply of prompts. You know, you can do it from anywhere. And, uh, you know, as much as anything works, it works. It always works, right? And you'll never run out of prompts if you do it this mm -hmm. way. So that's like the most useful thing that I can offer to people. Yeah. Well, great advice. Thanks so much. I, I'm going to take the, uh, take that in mind when I, when I make prompts in the future, you will see my one lane prompt at the end of the show. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> but anyway, let's close up. I mean, it's been a while. Let's do uh, the last poem that you're going to read. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would like to read the one that was in rattle if I may. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I can, I can pull that one. I think I bet I can. Um, so this one, now this one is not in my book. And uh, this was one that was so close. It was a crossover. It kind of belonged in the, the book um, that's coming out when the moon had antlers, but it also kind of was on the other topics um, that, I feel belong in my second book, which isn't finished and doesn't have a title yet. Uh, but you'll see some of the, the crossover. Mm -hmm. And this is called Tattoos on Young Women in Spring. It is spring again, and the girls pull off sweaters, 
walk into tattoo parlors and pierce a needle into the body like shoving a key into a lock. The barista calls up my order, a sleeve of blue and green turtles inked into her arm. Yesterday morning, the gates of my apartment complex opened, then closed. The food max across the way has gotten older and dirtier, the open sign brighter every night. I know now what I have never been able to say before. I will never get a tattoo or be a child again. Never return to that fresh feeling of milk or water, the raw sweetness of a carrot broken between the teeth. The muck may produce all the violets it wants, but the heart remains black, blank skin a reminder of what I haven't done. The island-like freckle on my hand floats in a lagoon of white, arm of a mannequin, ghost of a girl killed when she was young. Yeah, great poem. I still remember reading that in submissions. Tattoos on Young Women in Spring. Uh, Thank Trisha, you. thanks so much for being a guest today. It's been just a, so, so fun talking to you and uh, really informative, I think, too. So I appreciate it. Tim, this is so much fun. Uh, we could do this forever. We'll start our own university with our own <laughs> creative writing and psychology program. Um, maybe we but, should. you know, truly, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just want to... Um, definitely encourage people to check out some of those books that I've probably butchered and not done justice to at all. Uh, there's a lot of good wisdom that you can have. Um, so please check out those books. And, uh, and Tim, thank you. This has really just been so much fun. Yeah, it definitely has. Thanks so much, Tricia. All right. Take yep. care. Have a good night. And that was Tricia Faye Hefner. Once again, her new book, uh, which we were reading a bunch of poems from, is uh, When the Moon Had Antlers, uh, which is coming out really soon from Pine Row Press. Also, check out thepoetrysalon.com, thepoetrysalon.com, to find out more of all the things that the Poetry Salon does. There's podcasts, there's workshops, there's a whole bunch of things. So do check that out. Now we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to go to our open lines. Uh, so I will tell you how to do that. Um, the first thing you got to do is find the Zoom link, so you can join this Zoom. And I will post it on the chat windows on Facebook and YouTube. Only if you like to share poems, join the Zoom link. But before you do, email your poems to open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com. Email the poem there so I can show it on the screen. And then join the Zoom link, which I'm about to deploy. Um, you can share any kind of poems you want. You can share prompt poems. You can share poems about current events. You can share stuff that's published recently, something you wrote today. Whatever you would like to share. We have about an hour uh, to enjoy some poetry. So please do join. If you don't have a poem to share, just want to enjoy all the poems that we're going to be hearing, sit right where you are, either on Facebook or YouTube, and continue listening. And I will be right back with the open lines. And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Uh, the prompt for this week 
was a little complicated. You had kind of had to watch uh, Julia Kolchinsky Dasbach's episode to understand what this poem type was. I try to make the prompts as short as possible so I can fit them in our emails and things like that. Uh, but this was the prompt. I'll put it on the screen right now. The prompt was to um, choose an object and use it as a metaphor for the body. Write it using Julia's style of poem with colons. And so what Julia does, so so her book, 40 Weeks, if you might remember, or if not, go back and look at that episode. But Julia's book, 40 Weeks, had to do with those uh, emails you get about how big your baby is. So it's like a, the size of a peach, the size of a pear. You know, it goes on like that. And um, and so each poem starts out with that as like an impetus. And, uh, and so we're kind of doing the same thing. And she also has a style of poetry where she uses colons to uh, divide between sort of comparisons and make this like choppy style of poem. So that's what we're trying to do, but you could run with it however you wanted to do with this prompt. Mine is a very, very short poem because I had a very, very short amount of time um, before the show. A lot going on this week, but here is my prompt. I um, I um, you know, literally wrote this like five minutes before the show came on, but it worked, I think, for a short poem. Uh, this is I was thinking about um, my my heel. My left heel is just... I didn't want to play baseball or tennis. It drives me crazy. Uh, the the pain there, and then it moves into the arch, and it moves into the calf, and it moves into the ankle, and it's just this sort of never-ending cycle that the plantar fasciitis started. But I haven't had it was a kid. But anyway, this is my poem, Firefly. My left heel, a lightning bug in a glass jar, trapped. The Velcro strap, a lid spun tight, a zap with every step, the little bolt of light. The boy I once was, still there to shake it back to life every Sunday, every Thursday night. Very short poem there, Firefly. That is my prompt poem for the week. Let's see what you have this week. And uh, first up is Brian O'Sullivan, who's usually uh, later in the line, but he jumped down first. Good to see you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. I've noticed that too. Yay. Yeah, I think, I think I pasted it in Facebook maybe first or something. I don't know. Somehow you're quick on the gun. But, I'm on um, YouTube. Yeah. Well, there you go. well, what do you have to share for us this week? So it's a prompt poem. It actually um, was inspired by the poetry space that you and Katie Dozier had on metaphor. Uh-huh. Uh, you were talking about dead metaphors, and I was thinking about a particular metaphor that I wanted to see if I could bring back to life. I tweeted uh, Katie about it at the time, I think. And that's what this is about. Excellent. And this is TikTok, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. I got up. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. TikTok. No, not the app. The clock's click. I'll fly the days backward and... Bring a dead metaphor to life. Hands of a clock. Chase the blue marble around the yellow cat's eye. Slow as that televised car chase in L.A. in 94. Icily mark the ages of a life from first tooth in to last out. From baby hair to bone bald. It all turns round. Hand of a clock. Just poke me in the eye. You poke out the gray stuff and call it a day. Call it all the days at once. But no, let mortality go drip, drip, drip. Like the drip bag. Waiting. The last hospital room, it happens to you, it happens to me, it happens universally. Hands of a clock, you're deader than dead. Hands turn to digits. Passe, the metaphor becomes as this turned around syntax, even before our bones rust. Our words get had archaic, our metaphors melt. We can try to wind the clock again. Yeah, excellent. So what did you think about that uh, the form? I think, great poem, TikTok. Uh, what do you think about the the... That, that way that she goes about using colons. Did that work well for yeah. you? Uh, well, I, so I think I was kind of in between using colons in the regular way. Like sometimes I use them to just introduce a clause and mm -hmm. sometimes I use them in a more like metaphor binding way. I, I did kind of like it because I felt like it freed me up from having to write real sentences in a way. <laughs> yeah, and just go. having those, you know, the succession of process gave me like more options in a way, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, so glad you, you shared that. Thanks for sharing it, Brian. Uh, TikTok by Brian O'Sullivan. Thank Thanks, you. Brian. All right, and next up to bat, we have Audrey Friedman. Good evening. Hey, Audrey, how are you doing tonight? Good. Um, I didn't do the prompt poem, um, but I, uh, I actually wrote to a prompt from somewhere else from long ago to write about your horoscope or zodiac sign. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. That's about this fish. I am a Pisces oxymoron. A fish allergic to fish. Anaphylaxis. And though I am called to the water, I thrash like a hooked halibut. I am happiest on shore with the oysters and crabs. 
Every ocean needs a shore. I must be the alter ego of my constellation's ancient symbol, the inverted fish. You may bet you balance my upside downness, and together we are like salt and vinegar, the yin and the yang. Oh, very interesting metaphor there, and a, a little truncated sonnet, even maybe Pisces. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that that idea of the yin yang and the fish. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's neat. You're so welcome. Yep, take care. It's Audrey Friedman with Pisces. And uh, next up, let's go to Dick Westheimer. Hey, Tim Green. Hey, Dick. How are you doing tonight? Uh, that was a wonderful interview. I've, I've unfortunately not been able to catch uh, Trisha's uh, poetry salons because mm-hmm. they conflict with other notes, but I've got to have other events but i'm gonna try to yeah and she you know the whole bunch of people the people she mentioned uh like kelly grace thomas who was on rattlecast around 50 or so she won the neil postman award for metaphor for and the women said um uh you know great guests she always has and sort of co-hosts and there's always a a sort of a more lively um i don't know like a more collective gang kind of going on uh and yeah i've I've caught poetry i've caught the i've caught the podcasts Mm -hmm. um but it's the you know her workshops yeah which um, are the bread and butter of her work, but I'll give it, I'll figure it out. Maybe summer. Uh-huh. Will work yeah, for sounds it. good. So what do you time. have you'd like to share? Uh, so I did send you a prompt poem. Mm-hmm. I got to one this week because it matched actually one of my poets respond poems. Oh, They're both very short if I could uh, do that. So you got an email from me. Yeah, I have that. And then there's two there. If you want to read them, I think we, it's actually a light crowd surprisingly today. So if you want to share both, feel free. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, both of these were prompted by the same news article, which was uh, something to the effect of um, they've discovered, and I I forget whether it's a genetic or something like that, what causes gray hair. And the two articles I read talked about uh, this will be great for people seeking treatment Hmm. for their gray hair. And I was thinking, you know, it just just seems like we uh, we, uh, make many things into a pathology in need of in need of treatment and if one of yeah, them is well, gray that's, hair that's one of the best ways to make money is to make a pathology i guess so. just keep getting but it was to like work it over yeah the news article sort of led with it you know mm-hmm. we could have a treatment for gray hair and yeah. and no nobody in my family um has f- found a reason to treat their gray hair mm-hmm. yeah so i mean i still remember are... the first gray hair in my beard and now it's, yeah. you know, half, you know, maybe a third of the beard. So we're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> I have to get my microscope yeah. out. Before, <laughs> it was one it. very clear one, though. And then yeah. uh, I was like, well, here's a start. But, you know, aging. Well, and I, as you'll see in these poems, I don't think anything's more beautiful than my wife's gray hair. So here yeah. we go. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, so this is first to that prompt. Uh, and it was great to go back and listen again and again to your conversation with Julia in that very early moment. Aging in place, hair, gray, crazy, the way it grows, wires, hot, the feel of fire, brush, lips, taste, hips, rise, hands, full, heat, pulls, bodies, ours, us, closer, can't sleep, can't stay, here, awake, can't make, hard, love, Waits and waits until day, awake, no ache, nothing blue, just gray, the same, flash, skin and hair, hand on hip, you, 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 me. Yeah, great use of that form. Um, And uh, what did you think about writing it in that form? Because I was thinking as I was doing it that it made it a little harder to write, but I was thinking that if there's a poem that's not working, it might be a great way to revise into that form. You know, take the snippets and sort of move them around and and play with them that way. What what did you what was your experience like? Because it's new to me. I've never seen a that yeah, I, fragmented I had, structure kind of kept breaking me up. You know, you know, I've I've done a few poems that have uh, backslashes mm-hmm. um, in between, but I tend to put those in afterwards. This I was really thinking about what Julia was talking about about sort of like the almost like the uber metaphor of connecting two things that are mm-hmm. way different, uh-huh. but letting that, I think you talked about it being like the SAT, um, um, you know, uh, uh, I, for, I, for, yeah, I forget. Yeah, the simile 
test uh, thing. I don't know what they're called, but this is, um, so this is that. Something is, that. is to something yeah. is something. Mm -hmm. to, and so I was thinking about, you know, how both connected. And so it, it was actually generative for me. It was not a, um, I don't, I think I will use the tool, but this time I sort of like abused it. Maybe I just total, <laughs> totally, totally, but it takes. And then uh, you have another up. poem, Gray. So let's. Uh, so. Yeah, so same thing. This was the PR poem. Mm -hmm. Gray. My obsession is not with your gray hair. It is with you, the wildness inside, the way your body lets the untamed light spill out, your unruly mane, your rivers of wrinkled skin, the shuddering that uh, the shuddering and that laugh you let loose when I surprise us coming again, igniting after so many dry months. Every day we age, I find a new way to love you, even when everything hurts. Yeah, great ending there. That was great, again, to go with uh, Aging in Place 2 by Dick Westheimer. Thanks so much, Dick. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. Yep. Take care. Yeah, two poems by Dick Westheimer. Next up, let's go to um, Mostafa Sarwar. Oh, you're still on mute, so hang on. You got to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Sorry. There you Thank go. Thank you yeah. so much, Tim, for uh, uh, allowing me to uh, comment, uh, read my poem. Yeah, definitely this my pleasure. So, uh, yeah, so what was it written about? What, what uh, set us up here? It is on Tucker Carlson. Ah, mm hmm very hot news. Uh, the poem I sent to you, that was titled, But Tucker, welcome, interrogation sign, am I facetious? But today I changed it after the morning news. The title is now, But Tucker, goodbye, exclamation, am I facetious? Mm -hmm. The content remains the same, only one word it changed. Mm -hmm. Good, but welcome, it changed by goodbye. Yeah, well, and I don't watch the news, but I did see that piece of news that Tucker Carlson was fired after um, um, Fox News had to pay the settlement. Yeah, to to um, exactly. the the vending machine Dominion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit a little bit with the times, even though I'm not much. So it is interesting, and I mm -hmm. first uh, first started with a quote from the Andy Borowitz of New Yorker, and he published it on April eighth, twenty twenty three. We had a very, quote, we had a very, very strong case and would not have read like sniveling scoundrels on the witness stand. Close quote. <laughs> the Fox News host said, Ms. Tucker Carlson said that, <laughs> authored by Andy Borowitz in New Yorker, April 8, 2023. So now my poem. Your melodious high octave rendition from the self-proclaimed fair and balanced TV network, having the namesake of the most cunning thief on our wretched planet dwelled by QAnon. I enjoy high pitch rendition, apparently gender neutral, the abstract antimatter of Hermes, who declared in the open theater of Parthenon. No lies, smugness absolutely banned, pomposity out of question. I have been an audience to your truth telling in the open and reading the alternative facts in your boss's testimony in Dominion lawsuit. You can be wrong. I could not stop laughing. Heartfelt thanks for giving so much pleasure in a time when pleasure, a runaway bride, escaped to the back hole of the black hole. But Tucker, goodbye. Am I facetious? <laughs> That's my point. Yeah, very fun poem. It's so fun to have, uh, you know, have fun with poetry. So thanks so much for sharing that. It's a, a real laugh. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, and that was um, um, Abu Sarwar uh, with, uh, um, or Mostafa Sarwar, I should say, 
with uh, but Tucker goodbye am I facetious yeah thanks so much uh, next up let's go to um, Bishwajit Mishra hi Sam hi, good evening everybody good evening how are you doing tonight I can't see you I don't know if you want to be on video yeah, but no, so no okay. let me just I don't know what goes <laughs> so you can't see me? No, I can't. Uh, I think you need to. There you are. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Sorry. Okay, yeah. I had it. Yeah, good to see you now. So, how are you doing today? Yeah, oh, I'm good. Thanks. I, I just keep it off because when I listen to poem, I'm not a good listener. I close my eyes, so I don't want to disturb. Oh, that's that's great. And I read here, so I don't want to distract whoever is reading. <laughs> Where's my facial moment? So, what did um, you write for us this week? So I have a prompt poem. Mm -hmm. uh, and sorry, uh, last week I uh, was in the middle of the day, so I tried to jump in, but I had another meeting. It's yeah, it's just, tough. It's it's tough. Tough. I, think maybe, I couldn't uh, come back. <laughs> we have fewer people on the uh, open lines. It might be because those extra you know, two days fewer to write your poem, too. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this is uh, the poem called The Tree, The Metaphor. I get this prompt to write about a body part using a metaphor. Feels like a relic dug out of rubbles, a tree reflected in a pond or river or ocean. Do they have reflections? I don't think so. They're too mobile for that. Anyway, the reflection, the root on top. And the fruit, is that the fruit or the seed? the whole tree, the trees that were, that are, and that will be, the whole orchard with pulsating fruits, again, a metaphor. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love that, uh, the whole <laughs> orchard as a metaphor there. That's great. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know why it came to me, but I have written on these uh, upside down tree in many of my poems. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's very, uh, I don't know, if, uh, everybody's familiar uh, in Eastern spiritual, uh, uh, you know, traditions. Mm -hmm. The life is uh, seen as an upside down tree. And interestingly, in uh, the Jewish Hasidic traditions, like in Kabbalah, I read once, it's done, uh, it's viewed as a reverse tree, mm -hmm. the life. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so I find it very interesting, though. So that's yeah, definitely. Why. Me too. A very interesting image. Thanks so much for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. So do you want me to read from the last uh, prompt, the one I had sent? Uh, on oh, the, yeah. The yeah, classic? sure. Let me, uh, let it's me a small that. poem if you have time. Yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. I'll try to... Um, yeah, from... Uh, last it's week. called Desert. Yeah, Desert. A yeah. Dessert. Yeah. Let's do dessert. that too. A Dessert. And what, what was the prompt last week? Just refresh my own memory because I don't remember. Uh, it's from your camera reel. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Camera reel photo. So we have we have yeah. Bishop's camera photo here. <laughs> uh, this is a desert with some snow. <laughs> no, no. This is a dessert. A like dessert. A, oh, okay. I might have, uh, it's like sweet dish. Uh, it's a park I, I go, I walk very frequently. Uh-huh. And uh, this was late uh, in the fall, and I walked there because the weather was better. So um, uh, I saw this, and it was, it was cold. So I wrote that, uh, you know, on that day. Okay. <laughs> so I used that as a, I didn't do much for based on the prompt because I had, I love writing poems there, and they're almost like prompt, oh, like perfect. ecstatic poems, and they're very simple narrative flows. Anyway, a dessert. Kindly nature slides in a cheese slice between hot toast, and I don't let it go by. Walking into the park that I frequented on warmer days, when I must have sampled many offerings that I try to retain feebly in casseroles. A lucky chance today when I sit on my magic rock, surveying the altered landscape, snow sticking out randomly, at some spots, more gathered on the edges of the pond. Did they learn that from us? As I savor the end of the meal treat, just before the restaurant shut for the season. Oh, great ending there. Yeah, I, I really like that prompt, <laughs> getting to see everybody's camera rolls and what uh, what you're taking photos yeah. of. <laughs> yeah, and this is my favorite 
uh, part of riding. I love those points. They're simple, but I sit in the park mm -hmm. and I ride. I uh, go to the pond, whatever I see like haiku, I just ride. Mm -hmm. I love that part. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Well, me too. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Have yeah, a good yeah, night. It's always yeah. a pleasure. Okay, bye-bye. Yep, bye. Yeah. It was Bishwajit Mishra with uh, Two Poems of Dessert. And uh, the first one was called, um, what was the first one called? The first one was called, uh, oh, yeah, The Tree, The Metaphor. Okay, now let's go to uh, Brent Stauffer next. Hey, hey Brent, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. It's got low bandwidth, but it got you on a small screen. So if it gets worse, I'll tell you to just turn off your video. But for now, it's good. Okay. Okay, good. Um, well, it's been, a, it's been a really fun night. Really enjoyed the interview and, and uh, the poems uh, on the open line are, are, have been really good. This prompt was really interesting. Yeah, it's a different way of writing than I've ever done. Like trying to break it up that and like think with so like it's so choppy, you know. Like I tried every time to yeah. stop and think of where you want to move next. It was different. Yeah, because it usually and, talking and about I, the flow. Usually it's like a flow, and this yeah. was like a stairs or something. So you don't want to flow down stairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, it 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 it's it's such a uh, um, uh, a stylized form you know and and i at first i i, I uh kind of didn't really want to try it because i think well that's her thing that's that's what she does mm -hmm. that's, it's really cool but do i want to just but anyway it was really fun to try and um really did influence how in some ways it even influenced what the poem was about mm -hmm. well um, interesting yeah well let's hear yeah. it release okay release um, my brain's a barn. All the animals fled. A panicked amygdala kicked the doors open. A flock of fractured hippocampi rushed out into the open wide field, uh, into the wide field under an alien sky. Now I remember nothing. The prize ponies, Broca and Vernicki, raced off in different directions. Now I can say, Nothing. The occipital lobe in the sunstruck loft tumbles down, pierced by a pitchfork. Now I can see nothing. A blessed hush settles with long shadows over the empty building. With everyone gone, now there's nothing left to worry about. Ah, oh, that's cool. Release. I love the repetition of the nothing there. That really pulls the poem together. Yeah, and the the way the colon kind of slides in and out of being used as a colon, mm -hmm. and and the, the way that makes you question the phrase that follows the colon, like how does it fit in? Anyway, yeah, it was really it's really interesting to, to play with. Yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, thanks so much for for sharing that, Brent. Always a okay. pleasure. Yeah, take yeah, take care. I appreciate it. All right, see you soon. Yep, bye. It was Brent Stuffer with release. Um, let's go to um. Lucy Chow. Hello, Tim. Hi, Lucy. How are you doing tonight? Um, it's great weather here, and after um, an extremely sharp drop in weather over the last uh, half of a week we are finally getting some sunshine I guess. Oh, same here it's beautiful out a little yeah, hot like it's I, even, I went for a hike and it was uh yesterday and i was actually like wishing there was more shade for the first time so that's uh something new <laughs> um so what do you have yeah. to share with us uh, this week i've got a prompt poem mm -hmm. and i think um, julia offered in very interesting and I guess a little queer exercise for us, but it's also intriguing to watch what I myself got out of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah me too. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Let's see. I, I wrote about, I, I, I wrote about a uh, fruit as a metaphor for the body as Julia did, but um, it's a little, foray into the tradition of quince Aphrodite's um, golden apple 
is um, said to have been quince, a very um, old, ancient, traditional kind of fruit before, you know, um, things like apples or, or pears. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, let's hear it. Go ahead. I'll read the poem. Quince. Quince, Aphrodite's golden apple, not gold nugget, glabrous, aloof, apathetic, without aroma, tasteless to bite into. Behold a garden in October, autumn's golden center, sandy floor just starting to flutter with foils. Thereupon strewn fruit, size of a baby's fist, color of tart hard apples, awkward pebbles, unsleeked by river flow, mossed with aureate lanugo, newborn's fair brow, fingertips titillated by fuzz, scuffed off so easily they invite to be written into, initials, hearts, mementos, I love you, dear, you have a heart of gold. A lad stole one from the sacred fane of the goddess of love. Scrawled a maze, clandestine bow, tossed it aside, dancing his eyes, caught by the virgin's unvigilant nurse, said, gullibly glad, Could you read this for me? What does it mean? Before she knows, the word slipped from the fruit skin onto her tongue tip, slipped free. The apple speaks for her, words never too sad, unspelled, bodies willing and wild, firm and fibrous, sinews reluctantly carved onto, carved words die, with mellowness of decay, frost bleeding makes them mushy with age, a tender touch collapses skin, flesh wisps of sleety mud, Spindrift, no words of lust can live in slush. Now cold, hungry birds suck. I hold a young golden one in hand, scrub off velvety skin, slice pale hard heartwood, soak it, simmer to gold vermilion, flaring fumes of tart fragrance, gobble a spoon of gloriously grained mahogany. Oh, dear, dear, dear honey, telltale golden apples, ecstatic blush, bodies red jelly palpitating in the cauldron, making candid, clandestine, crimson, crying with pain, terror, joy, bleeding with love, body, pure crucible of blood. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks so much for sharing that, Lucy. I love the uh, the way that the form makes the uh, alliteration stand out too. It's really interesting. And, and your poems are always so rich, uh, full of images and details. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Have a Bye. good day. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah, it was Lucy Chow with Quince, uh, which is another thing I didn't know that Aphrodite's apple was a quince. Uh, next up, let's go to Nivedita Karthik, who I think is early in the morning where she is. Hey, Nivy, are you there? I think Nivy was having some trouble with uh, the audio. Let's see. If not, we'll just um, break off the Zoom and and. Um... Hey, Nivy, are you there? Hey, Tim, it's Nikita. Oh, it's Nikita. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi, Nivedita hi. was here earlier. Oh, so it's All Nikita right. Parikh. Great to see you yes, too. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> and where you're in India too, though, aren't you? No, I am currently in Scotland. Uh, ah. I'm a writer. In at the University of Sterling. So I'm calling in from Scotland and it's 3 a.m. right now. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> well, so glad you could join us. Did you stay up late or are you up early or what? How does the explanation yeah. for this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what do you have to share? So, um, I have a poem. It's about, um, you know, how a spoken word poem it changes the whole feel of a poem. And I have a great respect for people who do spoken word poetry. So it's about that. It's it's called On Reading a Poem Aloud. Oh, excellent. Yeah, let's hear it. On Reading a Poem Aloud. 
just the way a poem explodes mid air particle suspension dust glitter heart hair muscle trash stones throw from city centers below firework kaleidoscopes look knit kilt disentangling this day moving backwards words embryoning back to thought now an explosion now an experience now a reverse globe backhanded evolution language thought memory nothingness nothingness well, that's a very interesting poem can you talk a little bit more about um on reading a poem out loud how does that what are your thoughts on that yeah so um i had a reading at a, a poetry cafe here in scotland and i saw somebody read a poem and it's just the way you know when a poem is transferred from a page to you know open air essentially when you're reading it aloud it changes the whole feel of the poem mm -hmm. it becomes alive in a way and you know that whole that entire experience of listening to somebody reading a poem aloud it was kind of about that yeah yeah excellent yeah it definitely i think of um you know the words on a page is like sheet music to the actual poem which lives in the air that's how i always yeah, think of it absolutely yeah well so glad to see you again it's been like a year i think since i've seen you before and yeah it's good to have you uh, back on Six months, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, take care, and great to see you. Good day, yeah. Yeah, yeah, have a good night. It's very late there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that was Nikita Parik with, um, on reading a poem aloud. And now we will, I'll go to Nivi. Nivi Dito is here for a little bit, and then she uh, probably had to go to work. So I will um, just do her poem myself and, and read some other poems that we have uh, that people have sent in. So here's um, Nivi Dito. Karthik's poem, um, Nivi says, let's see, I've attempted to write a prompt poem. My similes are slightly longer, and I also have sentences strewn in there, so it's not a strict prompt poem per se, but I'm feeling a bit under the weather. Um, so here we go. I have um, pasted the poem in the body. Here it is. My brain is a vault that is. Let me put this in a, um, a Word doc really quick. Okay. My brain is a vault that is. This is Nivedita's poem. Um, here we go. My brain is a vault that is endless like the universe. Sorry, I'm trying to get this. There. Okay. My brain is a vault that is endless like the universe, holds the secrets of my universe, secrets that are beyond my comprehension, fathomless like dark matter, and perhaps just as dark and disturbing at its core, too strange to describe, soft like a peach, juicy and sweet to its dark core, but bruised at the slightest insult, hard like a diamond, faceted and tough to scratch, too hard for anything new to make an impression, creviced like the glaciers in, in the Antarctica, one misstep and a memory falls through the cracks, never to be retrieved again. Oh, that's great. I love the, the any one misstep and a memory falls through the cracks. That's really cool. My brain is a vault, that is. Thanks for sharing that. Great prompt poem, Nivedita. And uh, let's see what else we have. We have a few more people who emailed their poems in. Um, okay, so Katie Dozier, who, of course, does the uh, poetry space with me on Thursdays, she has both a uh, prompt poem and a bonus psyku. So let's we could take a look at both of those. Uh, this is Bake Sale, her prompt poem this week. Here we go. This is Katie Dozier. Bake Sale. My body is a pound cake, blonde, baked inside a bunt pan. The drizzle of lemon icing cuts the richness of my thighs, the crumbs of youth still clinging to the sides. My brain is a banana nut muffin, a Brit once called stodgy, an American too dense, but walnuts must be toasted first to carry the depth of scent. Eat me with chai tea, all too often given free. My heart is a plate of cookies with scorched sides, but the chocolate chips are still gooey underneath the sea, a rainbow of rainbow sprinkles splashed on by my daughter's glee. That is Katie Dozier's poem for the prompt. Excellent as always, baked sale. And then uh, there's also a bonus, Saiku. And the link is to Twitter. Let's see this. So it's, uh, so Katie's doing over on Twitter. She's doing a poem every day for uh, April, uh, National Poetry Month. And day number 22 was this poem here. Um, there we go, if you can see it. 
Um, and so he says, perusing the strange news section of NPR, I came across an article about the evolution of cockroaches that I then, for some reason, read and wrote a haiku about. And um, the article... Oh, here's the article. If you scroll down farther, that would be helpful. These cockroaches tweak their mating rituals after adapting to... Yeah, let me read the whole article. These cockroaches tweak their mating rituals after adapting to pest control. Oh, yeah, that's right. So what it was was that um, hu- you know, we, humans use, we use sugary poison to, so to both lure the cockroaches in and then kill them. And so um, as a result, this has ca- cramped the bug's sex lives. Um, but now researchers, some cockroaches appear to have tweaked the recipe for the sweet substance that males use to woo females. So, so traditionally, um, males make something sweet, like a, they secrete something. And uh, that lures the female in to mate. And so that's what we've taken advantage of is pest control. Um, but now we've adapted to pest control. I mean, and, and there's that. And, um, and then they've changed the, the, the recipe for their mating snack, <laughs> I guess you could say. So here is the actual psyche uh, from Katie right here. Sugar now tastes bitter nuptial gift. Sugar now tastes bitter. Nuptial gift. That's a great haiku from Katie. And I should mention, too, that the uh, topic on the poetry space this week is haiku. So if you'd like to have a roundtable discussion, just chatting with people about haiku, find us on Twitter. Katie underscore Dozier on Twitter is where it's hosted. You can also just type in the poetry space to listen later as the podcast version. But the space is a neat app because you can... Uh, a neat part of Twitter because you can have a whole bunch of people join in a discussion and kind of moderate it and, and flow through and, and have a nice roundtable discussion. Very different than a Rattlecast where I'm just babbling. Um, it's a good way to talk about poetry. So, and that is Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time if you ever want to check it out. The Poetry Space talking about haiku this week. Okay. Let's see what else we have. Um, um, let's see. This is a JB pen name who I love speculating about who this might be. JB pen name. The poems are always great. This is a gin still gut and uh, JB pen name is a poet. We have no idea who this is, uh, but gin still gut with all the rotten mash, the last night's fiery bark rectified to neutral spirits, the chest heaves, hot alcohol vapors, the condensation aches and quiet rivers down the arms, the streaks of morning infused with bowed wildflowers. These are the tinctures the beach tongue chooses, searching the dry mouth of each pitted breath to still the self, the bittered fruit, the hurt of clenched herbs, the acid grain that washes daybreak from the lungs. Oh, that's a great poem, as always, by J.P. Penn name. That's why we, I'd like to speculate who it might be, because um, Poems are always great. That ending is great. The uh, the acid grain that washes daybreak from the lungs. Very cool. Um, a lot of great lines in there. Gin still gut. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, JB. And um, I think we have a couple more that people emailed in. Um, so Steve Horrell says, I wasn't going to send anything in, but when he discussed write how you talk, I decided to take a chance on this poem, a tree planting work poem based on in the Queen Charlotte's now um, Heidi Gwai was published in an anthology of Comex Valley Poets, which fortunately includes Lynn Knight, who turned me on to rattle. Oh, that's cool. Lately, I'm having problems with my computer, so I can't zoom, but read this if you can. Okay, so this is Area 63, Moresby Island. I'm now Gwai Hainus? Hainus? Not sure how you'd say that. But here you go. This is uh, the poem by Steve Horrell. Area 63, Moresby Island. The top ridge is covered with standing timber, too scrawny, too steep, too far from that last setting to log. Looking like a mohawk haircut, a highway for deer, bear, home for near extinct mosses, haven for peregrine falcon. The side hill, a mass of stumps, sharp busted up limbs, grades down through several switchback logs, roads to Seawell Inlet. Thick Pacific fog below us, the steep hump of Louise Island, so close at first I thought only a river lay beneath that white foam blanket. The brooding shoulders of Telenquan Island and the tangled descending peaks, Tanu, Tunga, and those jagged rocks in the distance, the lost islands, the summit of Lost Mountain, no doubt beyond which nothing is found, only the mainland. The morning is cool, our breath damp, annoying white threads as we breathe. Coughing creates staccato clouds soon sucked into the pervasive moisture. The land drips even when the sky doesn't. 
We're climbing before the sun hoists its blast over Telunquan, and halfway to the timber someone yells, Here comes the sun, to an old beetle's tune. We all stop. Some hung over brush arms, spread like scarecrows, some caught twisted between trees dangling on a cock boot, looking like machines run out of gas, like ragdoll suddenly collapsed. In this country which seems to know no sun, the sun announces its arrival on rainbow runners, great circles of blue and red throbbing around the hot gold core, the fog heated, rushes uphill, millions of tiny water prisms catching the light and waves. There's absolutely no question in anybody's mind who's running this energy show. Jerked back into gear by a rising tide of responsibility or stupidity or some pervasive survival instinct, we move on, working, reforesting the manged slope, while below us the topsoil bleeds brown into the inlet. Oh, great voice and, and great, great images there. I mean, that's another example of the way uh, what... Um, um, Tricia was talking about, about describing the things around you and then letting the poem come from that. Uh, so wonderful example of two things we were talking about on the episode. Thanks for sharing the Area 63 Moresby Island. So thanks. Thanks so much, Steve. No, Steve Stor Horrell, of course. Horrell? Yeah, Horrell. Steve Horrell. Area 63 Moresby Island. Okay, a couple more. Um, Gail um, Henman has a tiny one. Uh, that she wanted to share can't join on air but here it is i'll just pop it in here really quick um it's a very short one on aloneness and this is gail henneman's poem um oops that's what we want on oh, why can't i do that there we go on aloneness among strangers too long alone with our thoughts cars in parking lots Oh, that's very cool. I like that a lot. Thanks for sharing that, Gail. Um, On Aloneness by Gail Hemmen. Um, Ted Guevara has a colon poem. And as always, let's see, I took off the many colons in this poem and decided only two were really needed. The photo is not so appealing. Uh-oh, I'm a little scared. But it explains why mulch is selling like hotcakes here in Aiken, South Carolina. So here's Ted Guevara's poem. Um, and here is mulch. Let's see. Red mulch. Can I zoom in? Um, here we go. This is the photo. He always likes to include a photo. Ted does. And here it is. Um, red mulch, one week only, special, buy five for $10. Interesting. Okay, and here's the poem. Uh, Miracle. I'm a mulch tosser this week. I've tossed around 4,000 pounds of mulch to truck beds and SUVs, and I feel decent, like I've cured myself through the labor and philanthropy. Except for one time when a tall, brawny fellow swung bags over to me like he thought that's the way it is. I caught the bags and tweaked the balance on my feet accordingly. With luck, I didn't fall over. Even the wooden skis were friendly. skids were friendly. They knew me well from the consecutive days I've worked in the mulch pit. The brawny man didn't, took, didn't look M.D. He didn't even know he was doing advanced therapy on me with appointments and prescriptions. I was a patient with a wonderful mulch thought that my handicap had been banished, had been corrected. Oh, very interesting poem. Thanks for sharing that. Miracle by Ted Bernal Govera. Thanks, Ted. Always a pleasure. So glad we get to um, some poems people emailed in that I could share. Uh, I appreciate always uh, that you send these in, Ted, and I'm happy to get to read, read them. Um, okay. Here's one poem. This is uh, from last week's prompt. Susan Talley sent this. We didn't get to it because we couldn't, didn't have time last week. But here's the... Oh, no, we did. This is the pasted on the window. Okay. We did get to this one. She just sent it twice. Okay, never mind. So go back for Susan Talley's poem. Um, okay. So that is going to be it for open lines. Let me do... I thought I would do... Um, share Kelly Grace Thomas's poem since we talked about her... Um, we talked about this poem, and it's always nice to um, share poems we talked about on the show. This won the uh, Neil Postman Award for Metaphor a few years ago, and you know Kelly is one of um, you know, Teresa's good friends, and they do a lot of stuff together on the Poetry Salon. Uh, the book that Teresa is, is forthcoming was um, a lot of it picked by Kelly, and uh, this is uh, one of the prompts, too, in, uh, in Teresa's book, Method and Mystery, is about this poem and using 
using uh, you know, verbing nouns to make metaphors in a really interesting way. This is And the Women Said, winner of the 2017 Neil Postman Award for Metaphor from Rattle. So take a listen to this. I'll let Kelly uh, do the poem justice instead of me. Here you go. And the women said, And the women said, Watch as men call us lottery tickets. Watch as they cash register us into gamble and to played out combinations of sweaty bills and pocket want. Watch as they lick their lips for that better life. Watch as they pout when we don't pay out. When the bling of our breasts don't make them Cheshire cat the same. When we got our own debts that got to be paid to mirrors, to mamas, to the way our hearts traffic light in the closet after we sold ourselves whole. And the women said, feel the way we became campfire. How we ghost storied into this dangerous beauty. How them men can't scrub out our smoke. How our blue learned to burn slow, stand still like the moment between begging and maybe. Feel the way we soil into shovel, how we let ourselves be held even after a matchbox tongue misspoke our flames, even after we told Flint you don't live here no more. The women said, feel how we are not open fields waiting for their strike. They cannot bury us deep, call us things of war, and be surprised when we landmine. And it was Kelly Grace Thomas, of course, with such great metaphors in that poem. And the women said, they cannot bury us deep, call us things of war, and be surprised when we landmine. Um, I love that cash register us into gamble too. A great, great poem there. Um, and the women said by Kelly Grace Thomas. Um, okay, let's go uh, wrap up the show now. And let's go to this week's Saiku. And the Saiku is an interesting story that I came across. Um, it was this from NASA. And I had, a, I sort of do a double take reading this, uh, this article. Uh, here we go. Um, Hubble sees a possible runaway black hole creating a trail of stars. Imagine that. There's an invisible monster on the loose barreling through intergalactic space so fast that if we're in our solar system, it could travel from the Earth to the moon in 14 minutes. The supermassive black hole weighing as much as 20 million suns has left behind a never-before-seen 200,000 light-year-long contrail of newborn stars twice the diameter of the Milky Way. It's likely the result of a rare, bizarre game of galactic billiards among three massive black holes. So, um, yeah, really interesting thinking of this uh, massive, like super massive, and I may even call it ultra massive. It's about the size of our entire solar system. And it's barreling through space, um, flying through dust and spitting out stars behind it. So um, pretty amazing image there from the Hubble Space Telescope. Was this still functioning even as Webb um, is doing uh, its, its amazing things too? And here is the Saiku that that inspired. At the end, even a black hole can leave a string of stars. At the end, even a black hole can leave a string of stars. That is your Saiku for this week. And that is the show for this week. Uh, this week's prompt, um, which we talked about a little bit. I said it was a one-dimensional prompt. I'm going to make it easy this time. We had a really complicated one last week. Um, if you look back at... Um, at um, Tricia Hefner's poem, Tattoos. We'll go back to this one. It was um, Tattoos on Young Women in Spring from Rattle. Um, if we look back at that, uh, we will, she, she talks here about, um, I will never get a tattoo or be a child again, never return to that fresh feeling of milk or water, the raw sweetness of a carrot broken between the teeth. So that's what she'll never return to. And our prop for this week was to... Um, here we go. Write a poem about something you will never do. So take that very simple line from Tricia Fay Hafner and think about it. Think about what, maybe what you might have uh, wanted to do with your life and now what you know you'll never do. Whether you're happy about that or unhappy about that, it's up for you to decide. The style of poem is up for you. But write about something that you will never do. 
That is next week's prompt. And next week's guest in the Rattlecast is not going to be a single guest. This is a unique episode coming up. Next week's guest is going to be um, poets from the New Voices Anthology, Contemporary Writers Confronting the Holocaust. So Howard Debs put together this anthology with Matthew Silverman, both two po- people that we have um, a history with at Rattle. We published Sil- Matthew Silverman, and Howard Debs was the ekphrastic challenge um, artist, a photographer at one point. He's putting together this uh, anthology, New Voices. Um, so we're going to feature... In addition to Howard Debs and Joy Layden talking about the anthology, we'll have Ellen Bass, uh, Lois P. Jones, Jeffrey Flip, uh, Philip, um, Alejandro Rescue Day, Andrew McFadden Ketchum, uh, Lauren Camp, Julia kolchinski dasbach and Jacqueline Ashiro, all reading poems from the anthology, all poets we've published before in Rattle. Um, that is the New Voices, Contemporary Writers Confronting the Holocaust Anthology, Rattle number 192, next week. Monday, May 1st, regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Should be a great conversation. Lots of great poems and poets there. Um, and very important topic as well. Uh, hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night. <laughs>